Welcome back from the short break. Once again, I am Dr. Joseph Long, and I'm happy to reintroduce our first panel moderator, JSAL President, Dr. Ike Wilson. Dr. Wilson will be moderating the first panel of our first soft identity lens, which is about understanding soft utility in the context of American strategic interests for the DOD. Sir, the floor is yours. Outstanding, thanks Joe. And uh, again, welcome back uh, to our um, participants. And um, Joe said, I uh, have the great pleasure of being the uh, president, I believe I'm the sixth president of the of Sauce University, the uh, uh, Joint Special Operations University. And um, this uh, in, in exploring uh, soft identity is one of a series of running quarterly um, forms, consultative forms uh, that JSAL, JSAL Next, as we call it, uh, will be doing to uh, more than just advance existing knowledge, but contend with that existing uh, knowledge, both from a thought and a, and a practitioner standpoint, in, um, to become more anticipatory and perspective um, in an idea generator. And, what makes that successful is all of you. So these forms are contingent upon a wide and diverse and diverse uh, integrated uh, form of consultative and uh, divergent, as uh, Dr. Long uh, said up front, divergent ideas um, as well as emergent ideas. Uh, so our uh, panel this uh, morning, uh, topic one, session one, formal title is uh, in the context of strategic competition. Uh, what is the utility of soft for American strategic interests and for the DOD? Could not have a better set of panelists here. And let me briefly introduce both, uh, each of them in the order in which uh, we're going to give them an opportunity to pre present some opening uh, comments, provocations. I mean, I, we're, we're counting on provocations. And then after that, um, if, the, if the virtual atmosphere isn't heated up enough uh, from their presentations, I think it certainly will be all. I'll use moderator discretion, uh, put some uh, integrating uh, ideas out for a few brief moments for them to contend with one another. And then most of our time today in this panel will be opened up for uh, an, a broad open uh, virtual living room conversation, conversation driven by your questions. So I would encourage the audience now to start uh, thinking of your questions uh, and uh, start putting those forward through the, the chat mechanism. Our curators will uh, take those and have those teed up so we don't lose, lose any uh, uh, pace and speed as we transition from the moderated conversation to the open living room. Without further ado, let me just go through a quick uh, uh, introduction of our um, illustrative, illustrative guest. Uh, let me first start with uh, TX Hammes. TX uh, Hammes served for 30 years in the Marine Corps, earned a DPhil from Oxford University and is now a distinguished research fellow at the National Defense University. So much more to say about TX, uh, but we'll leave it at that. Uh, our second speaker will be Ms. Uh, Stephanie Funk. Uh, Stephanie Funk is USAID Senior Development Advisor here at the um, US Special Operations Command and is a member of the Senior uh, Foreign Service. She spent three decades in Africa and most recently was the USAID Mission Director in Zimbabwe, where she oversaw a $270 million a year program. She worked closely with the military as the USAID representative in Djibouti and at the National War College. And last but certainly not least, we have Sergeant Major Chris uh, Vasatka, Vasatka, sorry, Chris, Vasatka. Sergeant Major Vasatka is a career PSYOPs non-commissioned officer uh, uh, with extensive soft and conventional force experience as a member of Task Force Dagger in Afghanistan, and then later with the 3rd Infantry Division during the initial invasion of Iraq in 2003. Uh, uh, TX, uh, Chris, and Stephanie, thanks so much uh, for being with us. Let me, let me just start with uh, my own provocation on the table, um, and then uh, I want to uh, give it over to TX uh, to, to heat up the room here. Um, and, and I've got this scripted out, so I don't, I don't belabor the point too much. You know, I'm going to take this, I want to put some ideas on the table in terms of this rediscovering the fuller utility of special operations. And, and here to provoke, set a frame, special operations forces are soft like the nations that they serve, um, are at a threshold crossing of a next era in what we're calling in JSAL this new fourth age of soft. In fact, I would say we've been, uh, we've probably been through and well beyond this crossing, this so-called crossing, 
uh, for many years now. Now this fourth, uh, new fourth age uh, is one of compound security threats as the opening uh, scene setter uh, intimated in a changing character of global geopolitical competition governed by a new and transformative compound security dilemma. Now, again, more of a back to the future. What may be new to us may not be all that new. It may be quite primordial. Um, this new threshold, however, of global security affairs presents the United States and, and other nations with nothing less than what some are calling, uh, going as far as calling an identity crisis. Um, questions of who we, are, who we are as nations and nation states themselves in the international relations of today and tomorrow. Who do we intend to be as member states of the international community of states and what that means for our utility um, forces, particularly to our conversation in the next two days, uh, special operations forces uh, themselves. Uh, addressing and finding answers to the last question, right? You know, what, uh, what, is, what impact of this change in ever-changing uh, geopolitical competition on the use and utility of special operations, soft identity uh, in a broad sense of the terms? Uh, addressing and finding answers to the last, that last question demands nothing less I would offer than a dedicated effort at rediscovering what may uh, somewhat lost appreciation for the full utility of special operations. And that is certainly, that rediscovery is certainly U.S. SOCOM's number one priority effort in the focus largely of this discussion. Uh, so with that as uh, opening uh, moderator frame, um, TX, over to you, uh, eight to 10 minutes and uh, please provoke. Slides, please. Yeah, that's a fundamental question we should ask ourselves. There's been a discussion in the theory of next about how the problem expands. We've got to look broader, all of government and everything like that in order to get the underlying causes and solve it. I'm a skeptic. We cannot fix Baltimore. In fact, we can't even fix the rural areas where there are much smaller populations, but we've got a huge opioid crisis. So before we go launching off on expanding, Let's really think about what we're trying to do. Next slide. Okay, you've all seen the disclaimer, so we can skip past that. Next slide. Very briefly, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, the underlying dynamics that are changing. Uh, General Petraeus covered some of that. Uh, but I want to talk about the changing drivers of insurgency and why it's a very different form than much of what our doctrine comes from of the post-World War II insurgencies. And then the role of special forces. Next slide, please. Okay, the primary underlying dynamic uh, is that because of the fourth industrial revolution, we're seeing manufacturing and services return to home markets. And we saw this was a manufacturing been growing in the United States by monetary value steadily since 1997. I realize in the two previous campaigns, there was a lot of lying is not too strong a term about the status of US manufacturing. And from 2011 forward, we've actually been gaining jobs. Up until 2017, we've gained a million jobs in manufacturing. Some uh, changes in tariffs and things put us trade on that. But what's really happening is because of robotics, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, uh, 3D printing, advanced manufacturing, it is cheaper to produce in the home market than it is to produce overseas for more and more products. And so we'll see that. There's great fatigue in the United States. You know, we've been doing this for 19 years now and the American people are kind of done with it. Uh, if you talk to people in your hometown, you'll find they would really like some investment in their infrastructure. They don't think we need another school in Afghanistan or in Iraq, but they could really use a new elementary school in their hometown. The changing objective of insurgents, I'll talk about in more detail, but that's gonna be critical. The other big thing is our ability to affect change. Again, appetite suppression. History does not do well for outside powers who come in and try to change a culture. Because the fundamental rule that culture eats strategy for lunch remain. And of course, you have to look at this through a great power competition lens, because that's where we are. That's what the national security says we have to do, or national security strategy, national military strategy. Next slide, please. Now, one of the big impacts for special forces in particular in the changing insurgent objective since 45, post-1945, the first generation of insurgents were all about getting rid of the colonial powers got that done. The second generation of insurgents was who's going to rule in this artificial state. And this is Foppola versus Unita. And they fight for over 20 years. But in the end, Foppola wins and rules Unita, or rules Angola to this day. But what's interesting is Angola has not changed its geographic boundaries. What we're seeing now with this third objective is that the boundaries are wrong. So we are not seeing state formation in the, our doctrine, 
We talk about forming a functioning state so they can rule properly so the government's effective for the people. That assumes there's an underlying nation. There are a people that see themselves as united people, united identity. We don't have that in many of these places. In fact, when you look at places, even Yugoslavia, which had had hundreds of years working toward identities, broke up into seven different nations and had some pretty significant ethnic cleansing. Somaliland is effectively three nations now. You look at many, many places around the world and what you see is they were, the boundaries were drawn by imperial powers for imperial reasons and therefore they don't work. They have to establish new national boundaries based around identity. And the fundamental problem with that, next slide, is that these are based on the failure of artificial states. Can I get the next slide? Oh, never mind. We got it. Um, and those are coalitions of the angry, the people who have been forced to live with people that they don't like and have fought for years. For instance, the Hazara versus the Pashtun. Not a lot of trust or love there. Um, and also opportunists, those who see a way to make a good deal of money through drug trade or whatever. They'll be based on the societies in conflict. And so therefore, imposing a government over the top of this doesn't really answer the societal question. There is no central provision or end state among these competing um, entities in the insurgency. Very often they're coalitions of the angry. When we had the Peshawar Seven, which were actually mostly Pashtuns back in the 80s when the insurgents were good guys, I was working with them. And they were the unifying force for Afghanistan. The first time we held a big meeting in the city of Peshawar, eight car bombs went off as each group tried to kill the other groups. So there was no unified objective. So multi-sided conflicts will be the norm. There will be very long conflicts. If you look at the Europeans, the period to go from feudal to a nation, not a democratic nation, just a nation, varies between about 450 years and 1,000 years. So if we're 10 times better because we're modern and we're educated and everything else, you're looking at 45 to 100-year campaigns. As General Petraeus said, you don't solve these, you manage them over a long period of time, like most complex problems. They're going to be very, very bloody. Civilians will suffer most. Next slide. <clears throat> now, this I picked as a map randomly off the internet because it illustrates the problem. You see the various competing entities in what is Syria. But even more interesting is for some reason, people drew the map, started at the border, stopped at the border of Syria. Those social groups don't stop at the border. They overlap into all the surrounding countries. They're non-contiguous. And so the whole thing is a mess. Anybody thinks they're sorting that out in your lifetime? You better plan on a very, very long life. So next slide. So what do we get to in the role of the special forces? Well, we're gonna to have to continue the mow grass. That has been one of those key things, as uh, Director Pateria has said, you have to sustain this, manage it at a level so it doesn't spill over. Uh, where you're gonna do that is one of the key strategic decisions. You can't do it everywhere. You have to do it where it's important. We can do counterinsurgency support, but we gotta drop the US arrogance that democracy is the way to go. Democracy takes hundreds of years to develop again. Um, limit resources actually increases your leverage. If you stay small, like special forces teams in, in El Salvador, uh, we had more leverage. The ambassador on three separate occasions threatened to leave, take the whole place and leave if they didn't make the political changes he felt were needed, and they did. Because one time he actually called and asked for airlift to take him out. Um, and then limited goals. We're not trying to fix the country. We didn't try to fix El Salvador. We simply wanted to keep the communists out. We essentially managed the problem to the point where the Soviet Union collapsed, external support collapsed, and then essentially we were kind of done. Obviously, El Salvador is not a smooth running and ideal country today. So great power competition. Uh, you're gonna do unconventional warfare, but don't teach light infantry tactics. We have to take advantage of the new technologies IEDs is an old technology, stunningly effective with new connections. Uh, ammonium nitrates present in most countries, the Baltics, for instance, in a stay behind force against the Russians, have hundreds of thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate. An IED with a 20 foot container full of uh, ammonium nitrate is a 50,000 pound IED. That will rattle your brain if you're an invading force. A mix of old and new technologies. And then one of the key roles of special forces is gonna be the link to allied forces. The locals can do the IEDs, the locals can do the short range drones, but the long range cruise missiles, the airstrikes need to be coordinated and should be done by special forces. Next slide. 
bottom line, we can't fix these countries. I will believe we can fix a country when we get Baltimore running and then take on the next big one, Detroit. And then somebody does something for West Virginia. If we can fix those places, then you can tell me I can go into some place like Afghanistan and have a half shot. Focus on the U.S.'s strategic goals. We are not there to make a perfect country. We stay small. We stay indirect. We don't make it our fight. But we do help others prepare to fight. I think that's the key thing. Next slide. Oh, this is my contact information. I'm more than happy to correspond by email with everyone, and I'll yield my remaining minute to the floor. TX, wonderful. Um, as always, uh, exactly what I was hoping we were going to get. Um, uh, Ms. Funk, Stephanie, over to you. Same 10 minutes. Can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Are the slides up? Uh, slide, there we go. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, following up on TX's question, can we fix Baltimore? Uh, basically, he's saying, can we fix nation states? And I would say, yes. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Yes, we can fix them if they want to be fixed. And if we have willing partners and they want it more than we do. So what are the characteristics of this new era that we're going to work in? Who are we at USAID? What do we do? What's different in this next era for USAID? And what does SOF and USAID have in common? And what's the way forward? So the characteristics of the new era. We are at a strategic, sorry, my dog likes to bark at the wrong times. <laughs> uh, we are at a strategic inflection point. Moving away, Zella, we're moving away from the global war on terror with more emphasis on competition. As we saw in the video, we have compound security threats. And that means there's increased authoritarianism, food insecurity, global pandemics, distrust of social contracts, inequality, climate change, cyber warfare, and um, increased disinformation, just to name a few. So in response to all of this, the National Security Council is focusing all instruments of power on competition, China, COVID, climate change, cyber, conflict, building coalitions, and democracy. I call it the C's plus one D. <laughs> Um, we've been told we need to engage, cooperate, compete, deter, and defend U.S. positions across the globe to achieve our goals on all these C's and the 1D. We need to compete to be the partner of choice across the world in defense, development, and diplomacy. And we have more resources in these fields to do it. We have to do it through a whole of government interagency approach and building coalitions with our partners. And for the most part, we're going to be working below the threshold of armed conflict. So next slide. So who is USAID? We are the world's leading development agency. Next slide. Our purpose, our mission is to advance national security and economic prosperity, demonstrate American generosity and promote sustainable development in our partner countries. We believe that stable, prosperous, and friendly nations enhance American security and boost economic opportunities. We also believe that along with advancing our trading partners and our position in the world, that it is also good to improve the lives of the people in the countries where we work. Next slide. So our budget in fiscal year 2021 is $24.9 billion. This is 390 million above our fiscal year 20 budget. Now, in addition to this, we also received $4 billion that has been transferred to Gavi for COVAX, which means it's going to pay for vaccines in low and middle income countries. And we're receiving another 5 billion to work on COVID. So if you look at the pie chart, the biggest part of the chart is health, and the next biggest part is humanitarian assistance, which is also health. So already more than half of our budget is working on health and that's before the additional $9 billion on COVID. 
So the majority of our funding in the future is going to be health related. Now, despite the fact, next slide, please. Despite oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so despite the fact that we have a large budget, wait, which way do you want me to move this way? Okay, despite the fact that we have a large budget, we only have 9,742 employees at USAID. And as you can see in the pie chart, 47% of our employees are foreign service nationals. They're local staff that work for us in our missions around the world. We employ professionals who are doctors, lawyers, CPAs, nurses, and we give them a high level of project management experience and responsibility. So the only, the US Foreign Service and Civil Service personnel are the personnel with the top secret and SCI clearances that can work at the higher level. We are majority of our staff based overseas, 56% are in missions and 44% are in Washington. Okay, next slide. Here are the 10 uh, sectors that we work in. Um, everything from agriculture to democracy and governance to education to health to environment and climate change, humanitarian assistance. These are the sectors that we look at when we go into a country. We will do an analysis. We'll look at what other donors are doing, what the host government is doing, what civil society in the country is doing. We'll identify windows of opportunity where we believe we will have a comparative advantage. We draft a five-year strategic plan with a goal and strategic objectives, and we monitor that plan year in and year out to ensure that we're on track to achieve those objectives. We're constantly iterating at a lower level to adapt um, to circumstances on the ground. While we keep the goal and strategic objectives in place, we basically adjust our tactics along the way. Next slide. So we work in a spectrum of assistance. Um, when DOD talks about USAID, they always like to say that we, we are a humanitarian assistance agency. But to us, humanitarian assistance is only one part of what we do. It is the, um, the life-saving response to man-made and human disasters. So fires, earthquakes, tsunamis, that's humanitarian assistance to us. The next thread of assistance is transition assistance, which uh, many people call stabilization. It's the assistance we provide in countries that are coming into or going out of conflict. And then lastly is development assistance. And that's where we have the five-year strategic plans working in those sectors that I talked about earlier. Okay, next slide. This is a, a map of where we work around the world. We are in a hundred countries. The countries with the black lines through them are the bilateral countries. It, there are bilateral programs where we focus entirely on what's happening in that country. It's what we do most and what we do best. The plain green countries are where we have limited presence, usually a smaller group of people working on technical issues, and then they receive backup from the regional missions. So the blue dots are where the regional missions are. They provide procurement, legal, administrative, financial assistance to the limited presence countries. And they also work on, on regional activities. So anything that really knows no borders like trafficking in persons, wildlife, water, things like that we have regional programs for. Okay, next slide. So about our culture. So like SOF, we have a culture and like SOF, we also have subcultures. But overall, there are a number of things you can say about USA that applies to all of us. We're a very flat and formal agency. We are not rank conscious. We're motivated, dedicated, and committed to development. And we really believe we can make a difference. We delegate authority to the field. We are task and results oriented. And we have very elaborate monitoring and evaluation systems to ensure that we remain on track. We believe in local partnership, local expertise, and local ownership. And we don't believe our work can be sustainable without working through our partners on the ground. We're field driven. As I said, we develop five-year strategic plans. Congress earmarks and directs our funding. So in those 10 areas of technical sectors, we can't move funding from one to the other. Congress is very specific about where the money has to be spent. 
And before 9-11, we had limited experience of working with the military. During the last 20 years after 9-11, we had a lot of experience of working with the military because most of us have been in and out of Afghanistan and Iraq. So the question for the future going forward is, if we're not going to be in war zones together, how do we maintain this link and leverage and complement each other on what we do? So what's different at USAID um, in this new era? First and foremost, we have just been elevated to the National Security Council. And this is recognition that development is a critical tool of national security. Um, we will bring our views of local partnership, local ownership, and local expertise to the policy making table. That's what you're here from us. We have a high level political appointee who has been nominated to be our administrator. Samantha Power um, has been nominated and not yet confirmed, but she will be sitting at the table with the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State at the principal's level. We have increased funding overall and increased funding for health, which is recognition that health is a global security issue. We have put a pause on all our strategic development plans so that we can pivot to the new priorities of all the C's and the 1D. We already have a role in the um, White House's Climate Change Summit, which will take place next month. And we're helping the White House to work on the Democracy Summit, which will take place in the next year. Um, we have high level leadership in our Civ Mill Cooperation Office now, and that leadership is involved in the NSC meetings. We also have Civ Mill coordinators in every mission throughout the world. At the same time, we've increased our staff at the combatant commands, um, and we continue with our emphasis on messaging to get the word out about what we're doing as a way to inform people about what the United States is doing and to counter disinformation. Next slide. So this is a map of the combatant commands that we work in. We're in every geographic command except for NORTHCOM. We're in SOUTHCOM, uh, SOCOM, and also at the Pentagon. 10 years ago, these teams were one person. <laughs> and now, like in SOCOM, when I'm fully staffed, my team will have 10 people. We'll be in Fort Bragg, we'll be at JSAL, we'll be in SOCOM, and in Washington all working to bridge the gap between the command and USAID. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what do SOF and USAID have in common? So we work in conflict and non-conflict zones across the world. We build local alliances through relationships. We are small but impactful and we punch above our weight. We work through a continuous feedback loop and we're thinkers and doers. So we're critical strategic nonlinear thinkers and we are change agents and we are focused on strategic goals. Next slide. So going forward, what are the areas of improvement for security and development outcomes in this new era? So I think we need to elevate and be intentional about civ mill cooperation at all levels from the NSC all the way to the field. We need to develop a strategic approach to the C's and the D. And we need to identify in the inner agencies the roles and responsibilities so that we can achieve success and leverage one another's work. We need to deepen collaboration on cybersecurity, share technology and leverage um, for advantage. We need to coordinate each other's focus on disinformation and amplify messages of success. So when China says that the US isn't doing enough to help on COVID, we should talk about the $4 billion we've just contributed to buy vaccines for low and middle income countries. And we should do that through DOD, through USAID, through the State Department, so the message is heard loud and clear. We should align USAID's capacity building activities with DOD's foreign military training and engagements. And in those engagements, we should always emphasize democratic governance and human rights principles. And lastly, we should maintain our practice of buy with and through our partners and continue to identify partners who want it more than us. Thank you. Outstanding. Stephanie, thank you so much for that. Uh, Sergeant Major Visaka, um, I'm hoping that you're gonna uh, help us bring what um, uh, TX and Stephanie have laid out at the strategic operational level you know, at to, towards the X, the X what it is today, the X what in many respects, what how we've defined the X in the past, 
and perhaps more importantly, what, what from your experience, um, what that X uh, portends to be going forward. So without further ado, over to, over to you, uh, Sergeant Major. Hey, good morning. Um, so I just wanted to start with how I see SOF evolving into the fourth age, as you call it, um, Dr. Wilson. So the fourth age, the way I see it, is going to be a lot like the second age was, but the technology and, and how we do it is going to be a lot different. So, you know, soft forces, I don't think need to be training specifically to be preparing for these LISCO battles. Because like General Petraeus said earlier, in these LISCO and big state on state engagements, soft is going to be playing a supporting more supporting role. Where we can really make money for the US government in general is by trying to prevent those big things from happening. So, you know, we need to be, we're best served by uh, trying to compete to be the partner of choice. And there were a couple of things, I was making some adjustments to my notes as I was uh, uh, processing the stuff that uh, General Petraeus said, because he, he touched on a lot of things and he said I'm a lot smarter than I probably would. So I put him in there. So, you know, the way, the way you, you've got to see it is soft forces, we're the ambassadors out on the front line. You know, they're, they're going to be working now. Soft are going to be working through the embassies and, and the national missions more than in the combat zone. So it's, it's a different environment, and it's a different way of working with things. You know, we're going to be somewhere, you know, covering the, 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 the gray area between the Department of State and full-on military. There's always going to be opportunities to use both to our advantage in order to pursue the U.S. national goals. So, and pursue and that, going back to that, pursuing the national goals needs to be our priority, not nation building or you know trying to impart imprint our views on these host nations. You know they're they're going to be our partners, but they don't need to be our doppelgangers. We don't need to try to, you know, and I don't like how your elections work. Let's work on how we change your elections. If the state wants to do that, they can work on that, but that shouldn't be a priority in soft conducting our uh, UW type missions that we're going to be doing there. Jumping back and forth with my slides, but the, um, our notes, the, um, okay, so, so that going into that, so we're the ones that are going to be the soft forces are the ones that are going to be in there engaging with our our partner forces day to day. The thing to remember though is is how we operate, vice how our competitors China and Russia operate, is we have partners. We are out there recruiting partners, not clients, and that's you know that's very much controlled by how we're even able to operate. You know, if, if you want to sell weapons and systems to a thing in the, the Russia, China model, their, their military guys that are working with them are able to do that. With us, it is very difficult. It's, it's prohibitively difficult. That if you really want to do it, that's going to be your sole focus because that's not what we're there to do. We're not there to, to sell the United States. We're just there to ensure that we're pursuing the interest that we want to get at. And moving on, so like I said, I'll, I'll reiterate again that the fourth age of soft is basically it's it's going to be a lot like the second age of soft, and that we're going to be out there trying to basically build up defenses for the U.S. to prevent ideology that we don't agree with from getting into us. But the TTPs that we use are going to be a lot different. So the the days of you know, I, I like to think of, you know, uh, Central America back in the 80s, because that's when I grew up, you know, and, and Central Central America back in the 80s, we did a lot of, of nation build, not nation building, but, you know, team building in that area to further U.S. goals. And the thing is, is you operated different. You could operate in a vacuum back then. You could be in the jungles of Honduras working with your partner force, and they only know what you tell them. If you tell them that the world is flat, they're probably going to be like the world is flat. In the digital age, you know, you've got Starlink going to provide high-speed internet to the entire globe. The days of you being able to tell them 
the sky is green is over. So you have to be able to do that old mission where you're, you're doing that, that partner building, but also able to compete with the real world, which has become much smaller. So they're always going to see messages. They're probably going to come to you with something from RT news when you're training them be like, Hey, is this true? Are you guys doing this? And you have to be ready to do it. And another thing that I think it's a, just something that we have to keep in the back of our brains as we move forward and training our, our new generation of soft operators too, though, is as soft operators, we have to make sure that we are, um, that we're pursuing the goals that we're tasked to pursue, not our own personal goals. We have to learn how to separate our personal ideas from what we're doing. And that's a very un-American mindset right now where everybody you know, can get on Twitter and say whatever they think. As soft operators, we have to kind of keep that in our back pocket, you know, maybe until we retire. But that's, you know, part of what we have to do because and I'll, I'll I see TX smiling and, and I'm going to say that we may not be able to fix Baltimore and we may not be able to fix them, but we can go and try to get them at least rowing in the same direction. <laughs> but um, just to kind of to wrap it up, you know, the. There, there is a lot of um, value that can be had from a lot of the modern technology, but you know, I don't have a direct quote, but I think Robert Heinlein said it best when he was talking in Starship Troopers, and I'll paraphrase it, in that, you know, even if you have a nuke, a nuke is great, but a lot of times you still need somebody to basically walk up and punch somebody in the face, and that's what us and SOF are there to do. You know, all these digital things are fantastic, but a lot of times you need that the measured force of, of a person on person engagement, you know, I, do you want me to kill this guy or do you just want me to twist his arm? That's the difference that we provide in soft when we're out there working day to day with the, with our partner forces is that ability to provide the level of engagement, you know, exactly that we need at the locate at the time. So that's really all I have. Hey, Sergeant Major, Chris, um, as always, as we always count on, at least I do, um, let everybody say what needs to be said and then always give the last framing word to the non-commissioned officer because they're going to lay it out with, without a whole lot of, uh, of extra sauce. Uh, they're going to lay it out hard and, and candid. <laughs> and uh, uh, you, 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 you did not uh, disappoint and did not and did not fail me uh, in in living up to that that moniker and that imperative. Hey, I want to um, I want to give you all the three of you an opportunity to kind of react to one another. Right, we've had three different takes. I might say that um, TX, uh, you and maybe even uh, uh, Sergeant Major Fasaka, um, your comments kind of gravitated around. If we laid this out on the con the continuum or spectrum of cooperation competition, conflict, and war. You all were right around that area. Your comments really gravitated around that area of the threshold of, of uh, from competition into conflict. You know, you stayed below it, but also didn't allow us to forget that sometimes the monsters in the environment get a vote and they, you know, they choose us even if we don't choose them. Um, uh, Stephanie, as would it be expected, you really, you know, lean more towards the threshold that transition point, I would say, between cooperation and competition. Um, I'd like each of you to have an opportunity if you have any thoughts on contending with one another or speaking to any major points that each of you made. I'll, you know, TX, I'll start with you here in a second. But maybe as you do so, you know, my question involved in that in that interaction between you would be, you know, how, how do we get more full continuum? How do we how do we bridge if I've got the constellation, the gravitational pulls of TX, you and Chris being more up towards that, you know, threshold into armed conflict, and Stephanie, you being more on the on the preventive lower end of the of the continuum spectrum. How do we get to that middle space? You know, in, in other words, how do, how do we get that integrative statecraft approach to to uh, um, competition? So, TX, uh, over to you first for uh, reactions and comments. I think that's exactly where we should be. I mean, if you're not near the conflict end of the spectrum. Why the heck are we sending guys out there with military training? I mean, we're out there and under Mattis is saying, have a plan to kill everybody you meet, uh, is a mindset. That's not a mindset I want from USAID. 
And I also don't want to be spending all that training out there. And frankly, USAID does not need that mindset alongside them. Because no matter how much you say we're here to help, if that guy's there in uniform and that gal's there in uniform, it is a different context. USAID has done some of its best work because in those areas, not with a conflict. And I think the key there, like uh, Stephanie said, the key is they want to change. So in those areas where there's not the competition conflict and they want to change, you have a chance to make the change. But as you start to push into places like Afghanistan, and we're fundamentally trying to change a society that doesn't want to be changed, then we handicap both sides. So it's not a stay in your lane. There's a, there's a certain amount of overlap. But as you move down a, the spectrum, you should get the special operations out of there pretty much as soon as you can to change the flavor of the aid. You're on mute. Awesome. Stephanie, how about over to you first, and then I'll leave it to uh, uh, Chris to tie together with his comment. So I, I agree with uh, TX. I think, you know, there is a spectrum uh, where we work. And in the areas like Iraq and Afghanistan, when we end up in the same place at the same time, that development isn't purely development like it used to, like it is in our other countries. And I think during the Cold War, we learned they used AID and development as a way to gain advantage in, in countries against the Soviet Union. And development failed as a result of it because we went into countries where we didn't have the right context. We didn't have pure partnerships. We poured tons of money in there and we didn't re achieve results. So I would say that when we get to countries where there's conflict and we're there together, that we need to be very careful about that, not use development as purely a political tool because in the end, you're not gonna achieve what you've tried to achieve. Sergeant Major, bring us to terra firma on this. Okay, I think, you know, barring us, Russia or China engaging it, the days of, of heavy conflict, I really think are coming to a rapid close. And I think that's a lot of that has to do with the shrinking of the earth with the internet and stuff like that. People have a, a people as a whole, I don't mean the US people, I mean the people of the world seem to be having less and less of an appetite for conflict that's long and ongoing. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like in Afghanistan, we've been in war there for 20 years, the Russians were there for 20 years before us, and the British were there for 200 years before that. That's a That's a very special area. And that's not an area that I want to really delve into with this, but the, the, the whole idea, I think, of SOF and us moving forward into this fourth age is to prevent these large-scale things from happening in the first place. I get it. We're going to be mopping up in the Middle East for the rest of my life, I'm sure. But the, the idea is everywhere else is to keep that from happening, keep that from happening in Korea. You know, keep Korea from becoming a shooting war, keep it where it's at and let it, you know, and, and deal with the situation that we're in right now. Let's not get into a shooting war. And that's where I think the utility of soft really comes into this fourth age as we move forward is, is keeping everything. You know what? We're not necessarily going to be in, we're gonna be in competition with our competitors, but not necessarily shooting competition. You know, like, hey, you know what? Mongolia might be a very strategic place for us to be able to move troops in. So you, us sending soft teams in there to work in Mongolia and, you know, develop the inroads for, you know, USAID. Like sometimes we may use USAID's money, you know, hey, a crop program, it helps them. They live in the high plains and they need some sort of help. And that's, that's where we need to, soft guys need to be in there in the middle doing that stuff. And there's also a place for the big army and, and the, the big military and stuff too. There's the, um, you've got your J sets and stuff like that. Like in Korea, we do the J sets and it get, keeps North Korea on the bubble. They're always uncomfortable because we're bringing troops in and you know, are is this time, are they gonna actually invade us? And there, there's real value in that kind of stuff. But the, the, the where I think we can make the money with soft is the day to day you know, around the world doing what we need to do. But the thing is, is you can only do so much. If everything's our priority, nothing's a priority. 
at some point we've got to ramp down our soft involvement in a lot of these places that we can use conventional forces to do them. I'm thinking places like Afghanistan and Syria and stuff like that. The conventional forces have proved that they can do the, 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 the types of missions that we need done there as far as, you know, building up military and police capabilities. But the, the simple fact is, at least with RSOF, is we go to th through very specific training and we need, we, there's only so many of us. So if you're using all of us in the Middle East, that means you have, don't have many of us for anywhere else. And I think we could be more useful operating in those areas that you can't send the conventional force in. They're like a bull in a china shop in some of these areas. And we're the ones that are supposed to have the, the kid glove training to be able to go in, walk into an embassy, negotiate with the ambassador to do a mission and make it happen. That's what that's where we need to be getting the utility out of stuff. And that's pretty much that's that's what I think, sir. That's excellent. It's it sounds like from from all three of your reactions to one another, it seems, you know, I don't want me to put words in your mouth. Please contend with me if if you know you don't like the taste of what I'm about to say. Um, but it does seem that the thing, one thing that you all are all gravitating in, in around a a, a semi-agreement on is the imperative, I'll, you know, this Sun Tzu, Sunza notion of first and foremost, it's the ultimate identity question, right? And the answer I think you all have put on the table that you seem to agree with, first and foremost, know oneself, right? First and foremost, know the, what I might say, go a little bit further and say the right and left range limits of the core identity, your jurisdictions of what it means to be in the character and culture and nature of uh, a professional within the USAID, the, the development world, vice, um, the defense world, vice, the, the, the uh, diplomatic world, the 3D model. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying unapologetically to kind of bring that, that rubric back. I would say development, diplomacy, and defense in that order, uh, in that order, um, you know, unpaid solicitation there. I think it's a very useful rubric right along with, it's better understand, frankly, than Jim C also. Um, but it seems you all agree, you all seem to agree on that, first imperative of the three of, you know, how to avoid mad banditry and getting out of one's lane. First and foremost, know yourself, then secondly, know the other, right? Um, but then I'm haunted by my conversation with uh, Director Petraeus a few minutes ago. And something I also, that resonates also with me personally and professionally of the warning of not in this next threshold crossing, moving into strategic competition not to fall back too far into our uh, into those stovepipes. And Stephanie, I think you showed in, in, in pictorial form where we were prior to 9-11, the last, arguably the last major threshold crossing, you know, pretty impoverished uh, from a developmental presence in certain locations, particularly uh, in those formations of, of the defense and diplomatic corps in those formations. So how do, any thoughts on how to get to that just right Goldilocks solution, not, not overcooking ourselves and return to our core identities um, that could lead a, on a path to perdition of separate, overly separateness. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, not trying to, to, uh, to be everything and therefore many things and therefore not the thing that we need to be for nation, not ourselves. Uh, how about that as a, as the next kind of, kind of conversation, any reactions to that? Yes. Um, my experience has always been in the field, people cooperate well. They get together, they understand, particularly if you co-locate. The problem always starts in DC and it's competition for budget. And keep in mind that uh, no pissant little war anywhere in the world is gonna screw up my budget. That's the fundamental position of every bureaucracy. It's just like, we're not gonna change the army personnel system just because six month rotations or one year rotations are a really dumb idea. So, the problem is going to be out on the ground is where you've got to make the link. And uh, General Zinni used to talk about hand con. You've got op con, take on. Really, it's handshake. Get in there, get to know the person, find out what they need, do what you can to help with what they need, and then they will help you. And I think that's the fundamental issue. We will never get the bureaucracies to agree. Our government is based on a division of powers. Stephanie mentioned, we're going to spend the money in this area because that's what I told you to do. So it's a 10,000 mile screwdriver handled by 435 people. Um, so you're never gonna get it from le that level. It's gotta be at the worker level. 
Um, I agree. I, TX and I keep agreeing on these things. Um, but also, I think we have now that that the NSC has set up, you know, all these C's and the one D, we have the ability to work across themes as opposed to working specifically focusing on countries and conflict areas. So I think that's going to be a new challenge for all of us. Um, where those issues are at highest level, I think you're going to see more resources and more people and the whole spectrum of assistance from DOD to Department of State to USAID. Um, and the degree to which we can develop um, overall plans that are specific about where the lines are of who does what, I think that's the degree to which we're succeed. Hey, Sergeant Major, any, uh, any additional thoughts on that? No, I think I honestly, I agree with that there, with them also. And I think, you know, the, the big thing for us as the military arm of this whole thing is to be able to fit in and adjust our mission to meet, you know, our national objectives. So that's, that's really, I think they're spot on. I really don't have anything to add to that. That's excellent. Okay. Um, let's, let's open it up to the virtual living room here. Uh, first question from the audience, from the participants. Um, one of the common threads between your comments has been the value of partners in coalitions. With our civil affairs partners taxed, how do we broaden our other soft capabilities to work in the military civilian space and retain while maintaining core response and combat skills? And that's no, no particular person is that directed to, so anyone wants to uh, comment on that? Sergeant Major's better position to talk about how to maintain skills. I think the key thing is don't try to compete in all the arenas. While we do need to maintain these contacts, for instance, uh, out in Asia, I don't see SOF having a major role in Korea or Japan or even the Philippines because there's invitation for regular conventional forces, and frankly, that's what they need. Uh, perhaps Indonesia because of the restrictions on forces, certainly not Australia. Same with the Baltic states, Sweden, Norway, Finland, et cetera. It's more the places in the world where we are not bumped up against them in a direct physical confrontation, which leads to conventional force potential, but in areas where we're in more of a general competition. And I think that's where we fit better. And I think we've got to be more willing to say, no, we don't need to do training there. I mean, I realize your first group, so by God, we're gonna do Asia. Well, maybe we don't need to. Maybe those whole, there's whole countries we don't need to be doing things in. And I think we've got to rethink it that way. Hey, I actually, I am 100% on board with you, TX. That's exactly what I've been trying to say with what you've got to do is you've got to decide on where it's important to use soft and use soft where you can. Now, the, the nature of the thing is we have guys trained for every region. So we're probably, we should be applying soft in every region because th that's the other problem we get down to is, you know, if you have six cupcakes for six people and one person wants two cupcakes, then somebody's having a fight. And that, that's kind of where we've allowed ourselves to get with this whole Middle East thing. And we, we've taxed our force to the point where, you know, we've got a lot of units out there that actually have to take a knee because they've been so involved in the bright and shiny object, which is the Middle East and all the engagement that you've got. You know, forces that are supposed to be working for Southcom that are, you know, expended and, you know, PACOM forces that are expended. And what we have to do is somebody's got to be the, the honest broker to be like, all right, look, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to, you know, get the six cupcakes back to all six people again and, you know, take some time to let the icing build back up. <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. That's fantastic. Um... Stephanie, this uh, Ms. Fung, this uh, question specifically to you. Could you expand on how the USAID five-year plan is tied to the U.S. military strat strategic plan on the ground, for example, in Afghanistan? So um, our five-year plans are country-specific, <clears throat> and they're always tied to the State Department integrated country plan. And the integrated country plan is always tied to the NSC objectives for that country. So that there, that's how we fit in the overall frame. And um, to the degree that the NSC has the overview of 
the three Ds, defense development and diplomacy, they ensure that it all fits together. Okay, uh, next question from the participants. This is for no, no specific person here, so any and all of you can respond to this. Uh, one of the key benefits of, of SOF is access and placement in competition. Where are the emerging locations in both the digital and physical space where we need to focus more effort to compete prior to our competition gaining a foothold? Um, I think the Sergeant Major can take the digital one because that really is a messaging thing. Physically, again, like I said, we've got to understand where SOF will be a key player and where the conventional forces should take the lead. And as we change our approach to Asia, uh, more along the line of the Marine Corps and some of the Army going to long range missile units to hold the ships at risk out at sea rather than large physical uh, positions. That also means that's what we can train the locals to do. We can share that capability with the, with the Philippines and they actually then have a capability. Training another infantry battalion really doesn't do much for the Philippines. So it's that whole process of spread out, analyze and decide. And I'll leave, like I said, digital to uh, USAID and uh, special forces do that. Stephanie or Chris, any thoughts on that one? So I would say, you know, we've, um, we have an innovation lab and we have people working on disinformation in our conflict uh, bureau and in our democracy and governance center. Um, but our technology is nowhere near what soft is doing. And I would say that as soft develops technologies, those that can be applied to assist us on the developmental front we, I, you know, the more we can benefit from what SOFT does, the better off we're going to be on that front because we just, we don't have experience in that field and we're just now getting into all of the issues around disinformation and how to deal with them and combat them. So I think the interagency approach is going to be really important on that one. Hey, Sergeant Major, how about, how about you? Uh, maybe particularly taking this, uh, this digital realm on, on um, in, your, in your answer. Absolutely, sir. So the, the digital realm is, it's complex. It's, it's, a, it's a tough nut to crack because the thing is, is since we're America, we see ourselves as the good guys and we are a nation of laws. And I, I, I said this one time to talking to some soldiers, they were asking why they couldn't do something on Facebook or something like that. And I'm like, as long as we're a nation of laws, we're always going to have more restrictions put onto us. So the ability for us to compete toe to toe in some of these digital spaces is just probably never going to be there because the U.S. people are never going to be comfortable with us doing things that China, Russia, North Korea are doing because it's just not it's it doesn't I don't believe it. It's like people individually say, oh, I totally agree with you doing that. But as a as a herd, I don't think we could ever really get there. And, and I think that's the biggest limitation in the digital space is balancing American ideals to uh, kind of what I, what I consider the wild, wild west. Everybody's out there going crazy and we're trying to be this uh, old west sheriff reining everything in. I might be a little bit cynical here and say yeah, demonstration of what happened in the last uh, two political campaigns, presidential campaigns, and where the parties went certainly followed no laws, no rules. Uh, the depth of lying was just truly stunning. So I don't think that's as much an obstacle as we think it is. Um, maybe it's because we actually have lawyers on staff and they apparently do not. I don't know what the deal is. but. I think, I'm not sure that's as self-restraining as we think, or if it's the military applying military standards to what is essentially a political struggle. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, ab absolutely, TX, that's exactly it, is we are the military. So we're operating by military rules of engagement. And that, that's absolutely true. What the, what the politicians do in the real world is one thing, but what they're willing to sign off for us as the military to do is something completely different in my experience. I'm, uh, you know, we're, we've got about two minutes 
I'm going to take uh, not moderator pr privilege. I'm going to take uh, educational activity president privilege here. And I'd be remiss if I didn't put on the table to to the three of you your thought. This question of you know what in everything we've talked about here in this in this you know part one of a, a two day conference. We're really talking about the future future environment. Um, the national interest that environment shapes, that environment shaped by our national interests, uh, U.S. in coalition and partners going forward, and what all that means for use and utility and identity. What, in your all's view, uh, future forward uh, forecasting? Uh, what are we What are we not doing educationally? You know, educate in terms of education and training. Educationally, what are we not doing, and what have we not been doing that we need to be th thinking about uh, to be doing planting those seeds now educationally again? Um, to actually uh, build in and, and uh, um, germinate and foster this new, uh, many respects, some some same old garden growing, but in some, in many respects, maybe in most respects, a new garden. You know, how how do we what what kind of seed should we be planting from an educational standpoint? Um, TX, how about we start with you? Yeah, I think the problem is how do you get people to think differently, and I think that's a lot of outside reading. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I put out a reading list that included like Blink and a, a, a number of books like that that were on the outer edge of how we think and how we innovate. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is I'm a historian, so I, I value history and there's very specific lessons. There's also got to be more reaching out to alternative thinking because, because of our promotion system, which is actively hostile innovation, uh, we tend to limit ourselves. Excellent. Stephanie, how about you? Sorry, I lost you for a minute. Um, well, I think as usual, DOD is out in front and JSAL is out in front. I think what you've done with those videos are incredible. And I've been sharing them to all the bureaus at USAID um, because at USAID, people aren't talking about a new era. Like when I say we're at a strategic inflection point, we're moving away from 20 years of the global war on terror into a new era. And people look at me like, what are you talking about? So I think building those links you know, when, when a DOD is like, okay, we're looking to the future and this is what it looks like, somehow it has to permeate everything. It has to, state aid, DOD, even our domestic um, uh, cabinet uh, authorities, that everyone needs to understand where we're at globally because as you said in the video, these threats are global now. They're not just national, they're global. And they're not the threats we had in the past, so we have to attack them in a different way. And I think the more minds we have at the table to deal with that, the better off we'll be. Excellent. Hey, Sergeant Major, as it always should be, the non-commissioned officer, the leader operator gets the final word. Um, what, what should we be doing educationally that we haven't been doing to take and make scholarship um, relevant to the practitioner on the way to the X, at the X, and coming back from the X, so the current and the future? Well, I think we need to figure out, at least with the soft operators that I've worked with over the years, is we need to transition our operators' thinking to the thinking for this fourth age of soft. You need to be a coach, teacher, mentor. Sure, you have to be tactically and technically proficient, able to go in on the X and handle business, but the most important thing for us now moving into this fourth age is to be able to go to a partner force, whoever the State Department or the president or you know the politicians, we're an instrument of national power, whoever they say is the right person for us to be working with and impart our knowledge, wisdom, training onto them in order to pursue our national goals. I mean, bottom line, that's where we need to get back to doing. We, we've got to stop being the guy that's do that's on the X doing the mission and basically making people that can go on the X for us and expand our capability by having other people that can do things besides us. Outstanding. Hey, sorry, Major, you got the positive, you got the positive north-south head nod from TX Hamas. So it doesn't get any better than that. Uh, before let me let me before I uh, turn it back over to our host, um, let me just thank each each one of you, TX, Stephanie. Sergeant Major Chris uh, Vasaka, um, thank you so much. Um, I think we've, I think between this and the keynote, we've uh, we've cooked the environment, set a great stage for the remainder of uh, the two days of of this consultative forum. I want to also thank uh, our uh, uh, participants for 
a series of just terrific questions. Continue to think about those, curate those, and we're off to the races here. Thank you all very much. And Dr. Long, over to you. Thank you, sir, and thanks to your panel for that amazing uh, conversation with the depth of the important foundational knowledge on SOFT's larger role in our national defense. Before we move on, we're going to take another short break and come back for the second panel that's also going to discuss SOFT utility. Thank you. <music>